Around the country in key battleground states, the Republican Party is on the verge of imploding. Republicans' unfettered loyalty to Donald Trump has led to disintegration and rot within local leadership, which is now playing out in some very wild battles for control. The most dramatic of these is happening in Michigan, where Trump loyalist and election denier Christina Camaro, uh, Caramo was recently ousted as chair of the state party and replaced by former Ambassador Pete Hoekstra. True to her election-denying self, Aramo is refusing to step down. She retains control of the party's bank accounts, which are reportedly near empty, as well as their social media and email. And she's planning to hold her own duly nominated convention next week. So it is all chaos and confusion in what could be a bellwether state for Republicans this year. Joining me now is Saul Anuza's former chair of that Michigan Republican Party and a good friend. Saul, welcome. Uh, I, I want to start with this AP um, report that talks about the Michigan GOP and how they got into this fundraising crisis. AP reports that the Michigan Republican Party was deep in debt when a longtime party donor who had given more than a million dollars over the past decade asked for a meeting with Camaro, Caramo. She turned him down because he was, shall I say it? A rhino. Right. So you have a million dollar donor who says, hey, I want to help the party, chairman. And she's like, well, I'm sorry, you're rhino. Your money ain't good for me. Right. How, what's going on no, in Michigan? I, mean, I, I think that's 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 part of the problem. I mean, uh, she ran uh, a kind of a populist campaign. Ironically, one of the other people considering running was the co-chair of the party, who was a very staunch Trump supporter. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Caramaro said she wasn't Trump enough. <laughs> and so, you know, they wanted even more loyalists out there. So, um, you know, and they said they weren't going to talk to the major donors. They wanted the grassroots to raise money. And as all of us know, that's just physically impossible. That's not the way you do things. And so, um, you know, they turned down the state party building. They couldn't afford to even pay, you know, for the expenses to keep the party open. Um, and so now they're, they are basically bankrupt. I don't think they have, you know, if there's any money in the bank, it's, it's very limited. It's very little. And uh, there's no, no money to run any programs. There's no money to assist candidates in running elections. Um, you know, these conventions are going to cost money. They also are going to have problems there. So, you know, I think that the party basically elected uh, Ambassador Hoekstra, who I think, you um, We'll do a very good job. Yeah, I think he's got a very relationship supportive with folks. Yeah. yeah, so but I don't know so, if we should say that because yeah, yeah, you might, well, yeah. <laughs> might get him in trouble. But no. but then you raise an interesting point about the convention because the reality of it is you've got these two competing event conventions coming up next week, uh, where the part the state party, the official party, now recognized by the RNC and presumably right. by the courts next week, and uh, Caramo's uh, effort are going to be happening at the same time. You were in my estimation, the last very successful chairman of that party. You raised, in a very short period of time, a lot of money uh, in, in presidential cycles. When you're looking at these two conventions coming up, you're looking at the party that's broke, and you look at the fact that Michigan is still a key player Absolutely. in who the next president of the United States is going to be, what's your estimation, and what would you say to the party activists and loyalists right now? Well, look, I think the party is going to have to pull together. Um, this is not going to be an easy task. Um, there are very passionate people on both sides of the issue here. Uh, but there's great opportunities in Michigan. I mean, we've got a United States Senate seat up, and we've got some very good candidates that are, that are vying for the Republican nomination. You have a presidential race that is very close with a very upset Arab-American community in Michigan, which makes up a large number of voters in right. Michigan that have traditionally voted Democrat. So there's a lot of factors that are coming together that could make this a very good year for Republicans in Michigan. So they can lean into that, that fact that the Arab community there, which is one of the largest in the country, oh, yeah, is, the is very upset with the Biden administration. Absolutely. And, and look, if you take a look at what's happened around the country. I mean, we've got Governor Kemp in, in Georgia. We have other people who actually ran outside and around the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, in the age of super PACs and C4s, et cetera, you don't necessarily need the party. Um, it's helpful. Right. Uh, there are things a party can do that other groups can't do. But the reality is, I think you're finding as these parties go off on the fringe, as these parties go into debt, uh, as these parties basically, you know, try to do, um, uh, you know, everyone, everyone who doesn't agree with them is a rhino, um, you know, Elections are about addition, not subtraction right, in this right. game. I mean, we need well, every Republican. We yeah, yeah. Young chairman a long time ago. We, we right? need every Republican to pull together if they're going to win an election. And so, you know, these people are trying to exclude certain people and make it very difficult to win right. elections. And be that's going to be the challenge. Before we, because uh, I do want to talk to you about national popular vote, which is something you, you and I work very closely on. Uh, do you see this as a little bit of a bellwether, what's happening in Michigan, also playing out in other states, potentially like Arizona, where, again, the state party chairman stepped down and you've got other types of, you know, issues, even 
even in my home state of Maryland, we've got some well, issues. Look, you've, you've got the National Party that's virtually bankrupt, right? They don't have any money. They're not raising money. They, they, they have not been very successful in that regard. You have at least three state parties, if not four, that are on the verge of bankruptcy, if not having very serious financial problems. Um, this is probably the worst scenario I've seen in, in my lifetime uh, with regards to what the state parties look like right now. So I, I think there's some real challenges. And as is always the case, it's going to be a function of a candidate right. stepping forward, right? right? And, I, and I think that's where you see the post-Trump era already being discussed by so many people, like, who are going to be the next candidates? I mean, we'll probably have 15 to 20 people running. Yeah, it's very going, similar to like we right. had in 2016. Yeah. So, you know, you've got a whole different scenario coming around in that regard. So how does the, the work that you're doing now in the national popular vote, which is uh, about, uh, needs about, what, 70? Uh, yeah, 65 now. 65 yeah. uh, uh, votes in the Electoral College to, to come in law. Tell us a little bit about that very quickly and how the states can benefit from something like the national sure. popular vote. So, so the national popular vote, there's two different proposals. One's a constitutional amendment to eliminate the Electoral College, which is not what we support. Right. We basically are supporting a, a, a process that's called an interstate compact, which is an agreement between the states to basically say when enough states join this compact that have 270 electoral votes mm -hmm. or more, they're going to vote as a block. And that, by, def by definition, will guarantee the presidency to whatever candidate wins the most votes in a presidential election nationwide in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So, you know, it is a very realistic proposal that's passed 16 states plus the District of Columbia. Uh, we are the most likely reform that I think would have a very large impact on how presidential candidates are run. Look, four out of five Americans live in a state that is either decidedly Republican or decidedly Democrat. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or right. a Democratic candidate, you ignore those 40, 42 states in every presidential election. You know, we, we elect over 500,000 elected officials in this country, all of whom are elected by whoever gets the most votes, but one. And the one where it president. presents the country as a whole. So I think this is a reform that would be very healthy for the country. Um, it preserves the Electoral College and makes sure states continue to administer those elections. And it strengthens the Electoral College by making sure that all 50 states are participating, all 50 states matter, and campaigns will be forced into all 50 states. So I think it's a good thing. All right. Well, I definitely want to get you back to talk. Uh, I know, Chris, this is an issue I think Chris Hayes would really kind of sink his teeth into. So I'm going to put the bug in, Nazir, to get you back on. Solid news is... Thank you so much, my friend, for being with us.